So my name is Casper, and I'm going to be talking about a semantics for a type and effect system. And this is based on joint work with um, Morten Kroh Jespersen and Lars Birgdahl. Um, so I'm going to start by introducing our language that we're studying. So it's a core by value lambda calculus extended with general references and concurrency primitives. And concurrency is expressed in terms of parallel composition. So we extend the standard typing um, with tracking of effects. And so we track reads, writes, and allocations. And here's sort of a simple example to illustrate. So here we're saying we have an assignment of uh, 42 to a variable x. And this uh, variable is an integer reference. And we say that the integer reference belongs to a region row. And regions just abstract over sets of locations. And then we also annotate um, the typings with um, an effect mask that gives an over approximation of possible effects. And this says, okay, this may uh, write to region row, to a reference in region row. And we are interested in using this to justify, for instance, um, optimization. So we also want some way of restricting interference or specifying um, interference from the environment. So um, the region context is split into two parts. It's split into a public part and a private part. And this is just a list of regions. And the idea is that the environment is allowed to access um, references in public regions freely but it's not allowed to access um, references in private regions. So uh, the full typing judgment looks like this, and the intended meaning of the effect annotation is just simply assuming that the environment only accesses public regions or stuff in public regions, then um, E or epsilon is an over approximation of the possible effects of the expression. Okay. So here's um, another example of what we can do with this language. Um, so it, it declares a counter, a little counter module um, that declares some local state, and then returns a closure. And this closure um, non-atomically reads the current value, increments it, and then returns the current value. And this is clearly not safe in a concurrent setting if you have other if you have other callers calling this at the same time, then you might not actually end up incrementing. You might read an old value, someone else will manage to increment, and you will assign an old value. Um, so one of the things that we can do is we can limit interference using the effect system and ensure that there are no other callers, and ensure, even though there's no locking, that this is actually correct. Um, so one of the types that we could type this example at is this one given here. So here we're saying that um, that we have a public region, and then we allocate the module. So we have an allocation effect in this region, and then we return a function from unit to integers. And this function is annotated with the latent effects of um, the function, but also assumptions about um, sort of which regions are public and which regions are private. And here we're saying that we want rho to be private when we call the function. So we're assuming um, when we type it that rho is private and we have to satisfy this assumption to call it. Um, and this basically ensures that there can only be one caller um, sort of at a time and ensures that um, it'll actually increment and return the correct value. Um, okay, so what can we use this? Oh, sorry, I skipped a few slides there. <laughs> um, okay, so we can dynamically um, allocate new regions, and this is the rule for doing it. Um, so it's saying that um, that we can allocate a new private region row for the duration of, of um, some computation E, but we have to then ensure that uh, the row region doesn't leak, so it cannot appear as a free variable in gamma or tau, and provided that's the case, then we can mask out the region afterwards, so it's sort of conceptually gone out of scope. So we can forget the region, and we can remove all effects on this region. So all regions start out private, but they can become public, so you can you can always make them public if you want, um, but once they become public, it's only a certain there are sort of limited ways they can become private again, and one of those ways is um, through parallel composition. So this is the typing rule for parallel composition. So the idea is you want to parallelize two expressions e1 and e2, and you have um, 
you have some private regions, so you have <laughs> lambda 1, 2, and 3, and you can give um, E1 and E2 exclusive access to some of these private regions, then they remain private, but if you want to share some of these regions, then you have to make them public for the duration of the parallel composition, but once um, parallel composition terminates, then they become private again, there's no more sharing. So that's the idea. Okay, so what can we do with this type system? One of the things is um, to justify program optimizations. Um, so you can think of these as, as um, free theorems that basically depend on the typing of the expressions involved. Um, instead of sort of the, the sort of analyzing the concrete expressions, you just look at the typing. And they're sort of like parametricity style theorems, except they're sort of proven using semantic model that actually models the, the meaning or the sem semantic invariance of, of these uh, effect annotations. And so here's one example of such an optimization or transformation. Um, and it's expressing that if two expressions don't interfere with each other or the environment, then running them in parallel or running them s sort of one after an another is equivalent. Um, so we have, um, we have, again, lots of private regions here. So we have no public regions, just to ensure that there's no interference with the environment. And then we restrict, um, we restrict all allocations um, of one of, uh, all, all sort of effectful operations of, um, of E1 to the regions that remain private to E1 and likewise for E2. So we restrict all allocations and rights to lambda 2. So we only allow um, the computations to read from the shared part. So this is sort of a f fairly, um, uh, well, this, this, this is enough to ensure that they don't interfere and that we can parallelize them. Um, so this is one possible application. Uh, another application is sort of going back to the, the counter I was just talking about. We can, we can actually give stronger um, data abstraction results um, that actually depend on limiting interference. Uh, so um, we can show, for instance, that the counter module I gave before is contextually equivalent to a counter module that does do locking at this type because the, the type and effect system or the, the sort of um, the restriction of, of interference means that the locking doesn't matter. So we have, this is the, the implementation we had before, and then we have an implementation that just uses a compare and swap loop to atomically increment the, uh, um, increment the count. And these two are contextually equivalent at that effect type. Um, of course, they're not, um, equivalent at a weaker type, or for instance, the underlying ML type of this. So it really depends on um, the effect annotations. Okay, so what we've done in this work is we've defined a, a relational model, given as, as semantics for this type and effect system. And um, the goal was to sort of support all of these things. So we wanted to support advanced effect-based program transformations. In particular, we're mostly focused on this parallelization operation uh, or transformation that I, I showed on the previous slide. Um, we also wanted to support both sort of standard ML style data abstraction, but also this effect-based data abstraction where you can actually use the effect annotations to limit interference and um, also reasoning about ill-type terms, which I won't say anything about uh, today. Um, so the other motivation, so this is building on a previous model, um, which had a very complicated uh, proof of the parallelization theorem, and we also wanted to try to give a simpler proof of the parallelization theorem and try to mechanize it, um, or to hopefully sort of um, get something that's more easily mechanizable. Um, so this is basically um, what this talk will be focused on. So it'll be, t it'll be focused on um, our new um, uh, proof method for proving this parallelization operation, which relies on a new type of simulation argument. Um, so the other sort of other goal we had for this project was to gain more experience with using IRIS as a meta language for defining such um, such logical relations. So it's all defined in a program logic rather than defined explicitly. 
Um, and we sort of believe that this is, uh, this is a good way of defining these binary logic relations. It gives easier definitions that are easier to work with and hopefully also have preliminary evidence easier to formalize um, in proof assistance. Um, yes. Okay, so I'm just going to um, give a brief overview of the sort of um, how you would usually or how you can reason about these types of simulation arguments in Iris, and then I'll I'll say something a little a little about our new um, our new ideas that extend this. Okay, so first of all, let's um, let's define what we're interested in reasoning about. So we want to reason about contextual approximation and contextual equivalence, and in particular May equivalence um, and May approximation. So this just says um, we want. So if we have, so we will say that that the EI, the, which we'll call the implementation, contextually approximates ES, which we'll call the specification. If for any terminating execution of EI in any closing context, there exists um, a terminating execution that that uh, runs to the same return value for the specification inserted in the same closing context. So we just want to show the existence. We don't want to necessarily show that all. Um, that all um, reductions of the specification give the same value. Okay, so standard way we can reason about this using logic relations. Um, it's basically um, do a, a simulation argument, a modular simulation argument. So the idea is you want to show that um, that um, any any reduction that the implementation can do, you can match with the specification from any related heaps. And if the implementation reduces to a value, you also want the, the specification to reduce to a related value and with related heaps. And if it reduces, if the implementation reduces to another expression, then you also want the specification to be able to reduce to a related expression and related heaps, and then continuing down and so on. Um, so this we can we can capture this in a unary program logic by basically introducing ghost state to reason about the second execution. So we'll have the program logic to actually reason about the implementation, and then we'll have ghost state to reason about this simulation down here. That's the idea. Um, okay, so we're going to introduce um, a ghost resource like this, a J maps to ES, and what it says is we own uh, the simulation thread J exclusively and it's currently equal to ES. And then we can express basically the simulation as a hot triple like this. So in the precondition we'll say the simulation thread J is currently ES and if we reduce um, EI to a value and it terminates, so the return value is VI, then we have to show that there exists um, a value for the simulation, so that we can update J to this VS, which implicitly means we actually have to show a reduction of, of thread J from ES to VS, and these values have to be related at the tall type. That's the idea. Um, okay, so uh, I glossed over a few things. One of them was um, I, I referred to thread identifiers. So the language that we're using doesn't actually have thread identifiers. It's, it's concurrency is expressed in terms of, of uh, parallel composition. So there's no fork. There's there's no threads or thread identifiers. But we still seem to need them um, logically to to reason locally about. Um, about expressions appearing in evaluation context. Um, so I'm going to do a small example that illustrates that better in a few slides. The other thing that I glossed over a little bit was how do you actually express this relation between the heaps? So what, what do you do about the state? And in these models, this is captured by, by the reference type or the interpretation of the reference type. And the idea is that the two locations will be related at reference type ref tor if the current value at the location in the implementation heap and the current value at the specification location in the specification heap always contains tor related values. And we can express this uh, in iris as just symbol invariant. It looks like this. Okay. So um, just to bring it back to the sort of previous diagram with a nice simulation, um, I just have a 
sort of a small example to illustrate. So let's imagine we want to show that uh, dereferencing S or X, uh, integer reference X is related to itself. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, first, this is, this is an open expression, so first we need to close it. So we're just gonna take, um, um, we're just gonna substitute in uh, related locations for uh, all the open variables, in this case, uh, the integer reference. So now we have uh, two locations, uh, uh, a, oh, um, an implementation location and a specification location um, related at the integer reference type, and we need to prove this whole triple. Okay, so what does this mean if we unpack it a little? So first of all, from, from the precondition, we know uh, that we own thread J exclusively, and it maps to um, this specification uh, expression. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that we, we know, so, so we're trying to reason thread locally, so we don't know the entire program that's running on the specification side, but we, we, we know that it at least contains uh, this expression and it appears in an evaluation context. So um, the implementation looks like this. We have some evaluation context K and inside it we have the ref of specification location. And from, um, from the assumption that, um, that the two locations are related at the the reference type, we know that the current implementation heap and specification heap contain related values at the two addresses. Okay, so now we're gonna dereference, or we're gonna run on the left, and run the implementation, and dereference, well, it's just gonna look up the value. And now we have to close the simulation. Um, so this is obviously fairly simple. It's inside an relation context. We can also just run the deref on the right, and the heaps didn't change, so they're still related. And we knew from the assumption that the reference types or the locations were related, that this value here and this value inside the evaluation context is related. So now we can basically update, um, we can update this um, um, simulation thread resource with this value and we can show the whole triple. So this is how you can sort of express these um, simulation arguments in a modular way in a unary program logic. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about um, proving uh, parallelization, and the idea is basically to go from having one global simulation to having many, many simulations. Um, Okay, so to explain uh, the idea, I'm just first gonna um, show how it was done in a previous uh, model. So we wanna prove, um, well, we wanna prove that, that uh, E1 in parallel composed with E2 logically approximates E1 sequentially composed with E2. This is the difficult direction of uh, the proof. And one of the previous models used a reordering argument, which is fairly intuitive. So if you if you imagine you have um, an execution of E1 in parallel with E2, and here I've, I've uh, colored the reduction of E1 blue and E2 green, so you have some interleaving of reductions of E1 and E2. You just look at pairs of adjacent reduction steps and then you try to commute them. And, oops. Okay, so this one just uh, reordered these two. And of course, each of these adjacent reorderings, they depend on uh, the effect annotations to actually show that, that, um, that they don't interact and that therefore you can actually do this reordering. And you continue doing that until you eventually reach a reduction of E1 sequentially composed with E2. Um, and this is fairly intuitive way of doing it, but it's also quite difficult to prove because you basically need an invariant that's general enough to capture all of these intermediate stages in the construction. And those semantic invariants are surprisingly tricky. So. Instead, um, the idea is to basically exploit this idea or take this idea of simulations and resources a little bit further and say, well, why, why just have one global simulation that we're reasoning about? Why not have multiple simulations? And we can even let some of these simulations share state under certain conditions. 
Um, so here, again, we have the same execution. And now the idea is we're just going to create two simulations. And the steps of, of E1 uh, parallel composed with E2 um, that E1 takes, we're just going to simulate in one simulation and the, the ones from E2 in the other simulation. So we basically cut out all the intermediate steps, and once we have these two, we can sequentially compose them very easily. So that's the basic idea. Um, so there's still, I mean, so why is this sound? I mean, clearly we still need to, um, to use these effect annotations to actually guarantee that, for instance, um, well, so here, so let's say when we actually do this reduction of A4, we want to actually know that we can do that step in this simulation as well. But the, the state here doesn't necessarily match the state here because we haven't actually done the A3 step. So we need to, to actually rely on the effect annotations to ensure that we can still do the A4 step. Okay, so how does this work? Well, um, the idea is to allow these simulations to share um, state under certain conditions. And in, in, uh, in our type and effect systems, the, the restrictions are quite severe. So basically, they can only share state at the moment if they're read-only. But you could generalize it. The idea is, I mean, this idea of using multiple simulations would allow you to generalize that. Um, so, um, Um, can't. I lost the thread. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, let's do an example. That'll probably illustrate it. <laughs> okay. So imagine we now have a reduction of, uh, or we're reducing E1. E1 parallel composed with E2, and we have the initial heap H. Now we know from the typing that, that this heap H can actually be split into three components corresponding to the parts um, of each of the, the private regions, lambda 1, lambda 2, and lambda 3. So we use H1 for the part of the heap corresponding to, to lambda 1, and so on. OK, so now we're going to create these two simulations, C1 and C2. And in C1, we're going to simulate E1. And we're going to use the read-only part of the heap H3. And we're going to give it exclusive ownership of uh, H1, the lambda 1 regions that it owned exclusively. So E2 doesn't get access to those, but they share the read-only H3. So once you actually do, once we start uh, reducing this parallel composition, if, say, we're reducing E1, then we know from the typing H3 didn't change and this reduction didn't depend on H2 because it didn't have access to the lambda 2 private regions. So this means we can match the reduction in the C1 simulation. And likewise, um, if we actually reduce um, in E2, then we can also match in the C2 simulation. And once we have, once we've uh, fully reduced the parallel composition, and we have these two um, independent simulations, we can just frame on the the part of the heap from from uh, the other simulation. So in C1, we can just frame on H2, and in H2, we can frame on H1 prime or whatever. So the, the terminal heap corresponding to H1 was in the C to 1 simulation. Once we have that, we can sequentially compose them, and we have our reduction of E1 sequentially composed with E2. So that's the overall idea. There's lots of stupid technical details to work out. Like, for instance, um, you need to make sure that, um, that uh, if you allocate uh, locations in these two simulations that you don't happen to pick the same locations because otherwise you can't just sequentially compose them. But yeah, I won't go into that. Um, so that is basically um, the conclusion of the talk. What we've done is we've given um, we've given a very expressive model for this time and effect system. It has lots of nice features. You can you can uh, prove validity of, of uh, program transformations. You can do uh, proofs of, of data abstractions. Um, and it has a much simpler uh, proof of parallelization. And yeah, that's it.
in some previous work, um, the restriction on the environment was about what it's allowed to do, and do you flip that? Can you compare what that allows you to do, which, which approach, and which one you think is better? Or? Are you thinking of, um, like Nick Benton's work, where they have explicit... Yeah. So I think uh, in that setup, the the rule for parallel composition was slightly different, but the restrictions were ba effectively the same. So, I mean, compared to that work, it's the same. Compared to Nick Benson's work, they have. But they the final one. Sorry. They also have the one with the final. The, the one where they, they distinguish sort of effects during the computation and from end to end. Yeah, but I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about just, just these, these two different approaches. What, what's allowed, it's allowed to do versus what it's not allowed to do. We can take it off time. Uh, okay, yeah, sure. Any other questions? I have, I have more questions. Very different. Um, do you have any ideas as to the completeness of the conditions you, you impose on the simulation? Or you missed up, maybe, or maybe not? What do you yeah, mean by that? Yeah, I mean... Yeah, and counter example for each weekending or not, or... They're probably not complete, but, uh, but I mean, yeah, we haven't, we haven't looked for counter examples, yeah. My intuition, if I may add, is that the allocations are an artifact of the, the restriction of, of allocations in the, the in the additional regions are probably an artifact of a uh, of the of the proofing. But those restrictions aren't there anymore. We removed those restrictions from the previous work. Ah, okay, you mean these allocations? Yeah. yeah. It seems to me that these should be... Uh, Don't... Because you, you have no way of communicating these, yeah. uh, these new locations to the other Yeah, I, th I would assume that you could probably remove that restriction, but uh, uh, we haven't tried. Yeah. It's not clear that it's worth it. I mean, so, you know, this would be incomplete in this sense, but... Yeah. You know, it's just a Probably. I don't see any reason why you wouldn't be able to do that. I mean, I think you could even use a different programming language if you wanted to. Yeah, I, yeah. I was wondering because for the, for the allocation, I was wondering if you could introduce a DABLA or... If you can introduce a what? Possibly. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so so we've looked at some of the other um, program transformations. So in, in this work, we've initially just focused on on parallelization, and some of them um, we haven't figured out how to prove. We don't know whether um, we need to add more stuff to the semantics. We also don't at the moment we don't support abstract effects. So like Benson style abstract effects, where if you have um, so, so the classic example is like um, rebalancing of a tree where you have effects on the underlying data structure, but they are not observable through the interface, and so you can type it as a pure operation. It, uh, we, don't, we believe we cannot do that yet, but we're working on, on adding that. Um, so basically, yeah, well, I can explain the ideas afterwards. Yeah, so um, 
it's not really very interesting for this type system, but it might be interesting for other stronger um, effect types, or at least we don't have any interesting examples that actually exploit it. But the idea is, I mean, the, the type system just gives you an approximation of the effects, and it might be way too coarse grain. So you, you can you can prove in the logic, if you have a concrete example, um, that it actually satisfies a semantically satisfies all the invariants of an effect typing, even though it doesn't statically have that effect type, or you cannot statically type into that. So that's one example. And you could also you can also do other things like um, if you you so so normally a reference type is an invariant that basically expresses that you you store well typed values. But if you know it's private, then no one else can can observe it, so you could potentially locally break well typedness and store booleans and integer references and stuff like that, as long as you re-establish well typedness before anybody else can notice it. So this is like so. an example, you could reason about something like the unsafe thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, but I mean, but, but there's a very long way from this type and effect system to Rust. And <laughs> Yeah. Okay, and that's thanks.